as he stood before Goliath and slayed a giant, as he took a lion and a bear, killed them by his own bare hands. All the things happened to him. He did great, wonderful things. But we also found out that David was a man who had failures. Can you relate? Isn't it amazing how in the same vessel we can have such awesomeness and such treasure, and then the next minute we feel like we got some trash? See, I believe that's part of that sword business that David, that John just talked about. I've been saying this for a while. God, we feel like God's trying to kill us sometimes. <laughs> He's not trying to kill us. He's trying to kill what's killing us. He's trying to set us free. And it's not pleasant, and it's not fun, and it's, and it's very painful sometimes. Anybody say amen to that? Amen. Surgery is not fun, but he said he would, take, he would do a surgery on our heart. And I've seen him do it in this house. He said he would take out an old stony heart and he replaced it with a heart that could be moved, a heart that could be touched. And I love that. And it's funny because somebody I was talking to this week um, that's kind of new to the church, but they said one of the things that impressed him about this church, I said two things. Um, as many young people as we have and children, we have a lot of youth in this church, younger people, younger couples. Um, and but also she said we have so many men in the altars she said I've never been to a church where I've seen so many men on their knees Sunday after Sunday wow I had never thought about it a lot of churches it's women that'll seem a little more emotional or whatever and we are but the truth is God is doing something deeper than just emotion He's changing people. And, and, and what I see, and I look every week, I look on these altars, I see puddles of tears, and most of the time it's my men. It hurts when you're getting some stuff cut off. But that when, when he's surgically saying, oh, that's me. Oh, my goodness, i got to die to that one too. And I see men, grown men. Do you know there's nothing any more attractive to a woman or to children to see their daddy or a man worshiping and praising God? Every woman wants a godly man. Well, a woman that's got a godly heart. And women that don't have it yet, that's what they really long for. You can make a list of what do you want in a, in a, in a, in a spouse. And, you know, they're not going to, you know, we may tease around and say tall, dark, and handsome. Or, but do what they really want, you know what they say? They want a man that's faithful. They want a man that'll love them. As the Bible said, as Christ loved the church and gave himself. See, there's giving in love. Love gives. Lust takes young people, old people, middle people. Lust takes. Love gives. Love is patient. It'll wait. This is not on my deal. This is for somebody. It'll wait. It's worth waiting for. I want to encourage, especially our, our single adults. We have a lot of single adults. It's worth, it's worth waiting for. Don't settle for, for just some emotional thing or what you think your needs are. And we have needs, but when we, when we pick somebody out of our needs, we're actually picking somebody out of our dysfunction, and then we end up with dysfunctional relationships. But we've ta been talking about David. And for all the victories he had, we saw we, last week, um, we ended on a woman, <laughs> Bathsheba. And... Um, and it was lust. He had, all, he had wives that he loved. He had, I guess he loved them. I don't know. He didn't act too much like it. But it was the thing of the day to have many wives and concubines. And, and it was such a lustful thing that was going on. They were letting him run rapid. And it got David by trying to fit in and being like other people. Before him was, was Saul. David was picked, to, was replacing Saul. And, and David failed, truthfully. And we talked about the story it seems like David really had bigger failure than Saul. We don't really find Saul killing anybody. David had, uh, in his um, get in a hurry, trying to get the ark, he called Uzzah to die. He was out of order, and he called a good man to die. Then later on, he killed Uriah the Hittite, the husband of, of, of Bathsheba. Later on, we find out that he, he got ahead of God, too, and, and uh, well, he decided to count the people. The Lord then said, you don't count the people, because taking the census meant you were going to put your confidence in how many soldiers you had. But he already said, David, before, it said, I will not put my confidence in chariots and horses and the legs of men. It will not be that. It will always be the Spirit of the Lord that will go before us. 
And because of that, uh, thousands died that day. So there was a lot of mistakes that David made, and, and, and Saul didn't seem to do that much. But for some reason, Saul had, been, had the spirit removed from him, and he told Saul, he said, your, your kids won't get the kingdom. I'm going to take it away from you, and I'm going to give it to the son of Jesse, a nobody. Nobody. He was a nobody. Anybody here feel like you're just, you know, your family just wasn't the most well-known in town? Well, some of you actually, they probably was the well-known in town, but it might not have been the way, you know, I watched those records in the, in the paper. Seeing how many of mine are in there. Okay. Okay. I got myself off right there. He was a nobody. Seeming to the world. We talked last night, God picks unlikely people. So what was the difference in save, uh, Saul and David? First of all, Saul did not understand his need of God. He just didn't understand it. He did not go inquire of God. He didn't need the ark of God. He didn't want to go to trouble and mess with that thing because it had, did cause some people some problems we talked about last week in, 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 in some private things. I mean, it was a, that ark was something that you didn't want to mess with. But he just, he did not really seek the Lord. And when he missed the Lord and he had re repercussions, instead of becoming repentant and humble, he became bitter and became revengeful. And he started trying, he became jealous. He tried to kill David over and over. And because of this, the Bible says because he did not seek the Lord, he, did, he, got the, he, he took it away from him. On the other hand, David, who failed miserably several times, but David would be quick to repent. He was quick. As soon as he would feel that I've realized I've been off. And then for a while, he did a lesson. He was blinded to it. It took the person of God, the minister, to come to him, the prophet, and say, You're the man, David. You're the one that, and David said, oh my goodness, I'm worthy of death. And immediately he humbled himself. And you find out in, in Psalms 51, he prays his prayer and says, oh Lord, create a clean heart and a right spirit in me. Don't take your spirit from me. Do you know David was more uh, concerned about losing the power of the spirit than he was the position of the king? He desired a power over position. He knew where his power lay. He knew it wasn't him, that little rock that took that giant down. He knew when it went out and would slay people. Sometimes the Lord said, just don't even do anything. Just come over here and send your worshipers out. And the enemy would just kill each other. It's crazy the stuff that God did for him. But isn't it amazing how God could do absolutely crazy, awesome, wonderful things to you? And two weeks later, you're in the depression and going, I don't know if God's there. Oh, I wouldn't be like the Israelites. Yeah, you are. I mean, if I didn't have to work, I just got manna every day from heaven. I wouldn't be complaining. Yeah, you would. Yeah. I complain. Why in Gainesville got more restaurants? <laughs> they said, didn't, can't we just have some garlic and some leech? They started complaining. Okay, we want some meat. Wait, the Lord, oh, that was not fun. I tell you, you better be careful about complaining and not being thankful. Because a heart of ungratefulness, there's all kind of stuff that starts happening out of it. We have a lot to be thankful today, don't we? We have a lot to be thankful for today. So David was different in the fact that he understood his need of God. He inquired of the Lord and he was quick to humble himself and then to repent, to turn around and say, I need to do it differently. So a lot of people have remorse, but they don't want to repent. Repent means you change. Remorse is godly sorrow, but godly sorrow should lead to repentance, which means make you should change. If somebody's slapping you and say, oh, I'm so sorry, baby, I didn't mean to do it. They slap you again and say, let me tell you something. When you change, when you repent, you can be sorry all day long. You want to, but until you repent, you're not going to see this face, much less slap it. And I do believe in marriage, but I'm going to tell you what. I'm, I believe it's time for some people to get a hold of themselves because it's not just about that. It's about your children. This is a generational thing. You don't just do this and get away with it, mom and daddy. Do you understand that you're raising children and they're going to marry somebody? They're going to pick somebody maybe just like you. And you're going to be crying the blues when that little grandbaby comes along and she's run off with it and they're not married. You have no power, grandma. You know why I talk like this? Because I counsel people like this. I thank 
God my grandbabies have good parents. Oh, my Lord, I thank God for it because I've counseled so many grandparents that have to suffer that. But let me tell you something. We don't control our kids, but I'm going to tell you something. While you have a chance in your home, honey, you have every responsibility in the world. The world, he said, when they rise up and when they lay down, when they walk by the way, when they're riding in the car, you need to be speaking the goodness of God over your children. If you've got something to grab and complain about it, get on your knees and do it. And if your spouse is doing it, say, let's change the subject. We'll go back in the back room and discuss that. There's little ears that need to know that there is a God. Because your kids are going to school, they get bullied, they get ostracized. We don't even know what our kids are getting. Our little children are having pornography put in their faces. I have a little boy this week, his mama called me because he got on something and he ran in the room and he was crying. He goes, what is this stuff? And it just it disturbed this little boy so much what he saw. Kids should not see that stuff. When we had CPS foster parents, that was, that was considered abuse to let your kids watch pornography because it messed with their minds before they were able to understand that stuff. See, that's the world we live in. We are, daddies, mom, you need to take control of your home. You need to take control of what your kids are watching, what games they're playing. That same kid's having nightmares. Nightmares. He got on some game, and it was, it was called the Exorcist game. He didn't know what the Exorcist was. That's back in my day. I knew that movie. A game. And he was seeing demons every night. She said, I didn't know what's wrong with him. He can't sleep. He's not going to school. And he told me, he gave me graphic details, what he saw in that game. And it was coming in his room. And it was the exorcist. And they were telling me, use a cross and holy water. He said, when I closed my eyes, I, I, just, I just imagined I had some holy water. I imagined I had a cross. This stuff is real. This is not some game where a bunch of prudes. No, you need to pay attention to what's going on in the minds and hearts of your kids. This is nowhere in my message, but it's in his message. Hallelujah, hallelujah. But David, David made mistakes. In fact, the Bible said there was a place in David. He said, I want to build you a temple, Lord. He said, why can't I just sit in this big mansion up here and your, your ark of the covenant is in a tent? He goes, I want, it to be, I want it to be better than me. He loved God so much. But the Lord said, you know what? David, you have so much blood on your hands. You have so much blood, I'm not going to let you build it. He said, let me tell you what I'm going to do. The God is so cool. He said, remember that woman, Bathsheba, the one that got you in such trouble? You know, the Bible said after he did that, his, the sword never left his house. He had situations in his family. His son rose up and tried to take the kingdom. His other son raped one of his daughters. I mean, all kinds of dysfunctional stuff happened. Oh, yeah, incest was in the Bible back there, too. It don't just happen in your home, in your family. It happened back then. And it was as deadly then as it is today. But the, he said, you remember Bathsheba? He said, I'm going to take one of her boys. I'm going to take her youngest bo- son by you. And I'm going to make him the one that's going to be the heir of the king to your throne. Isn't that funny? His biggest mess up is where he ended up with the baby, that that's the one he picked. It wasn't Michael's. It wasn't uh, uh, Abigail's. It wasn't his wife's. But he picked Bathsheba. You know, even the place of your greatest failure, God can turn that around for something beautiful if you give it to him. He said, the Lord has said, I have picked Solomon to be the one, not only to take the kingdom, but Solomon's going to be the one that's going to build my house. He said, you just get prepared, Daddy. It's not going to be about you, but you're preparing something. The Lord spoke to Gary and I one day. He said, it's not all about what you're doing. It's who you're preparing. See, it's not all about our ministry. It's about what you're going to do with your ministry. See, preachers, they get real confused thinking they're the one. No, all we're doing is trying to help you be the one. And the one, and the one, and the one, and the one. We are to prepare for you the work of the ministry. It's your ministry. But it's a David. He said, uh, I'm going to allow your son. He's going to build the house. And David worked the rest of his life, took his money. He, he, bought, he got the trees cut down, had the lumber ready. He had, the, he had the, the gold ready. He got the workers ready. He had everything prepared for his son. And it's amazing. Today, you don't hear... It called the son, the house of David. You don't. It's not called the uh, the David's temple. It's called what? Solomon's temple. Solomon's temple. But you know what? The Lord showed me something. He may not have been the house that physical house that's that they're trying to rebuild over there today. Uh, he may not have had that house, that temple named after him. But there was a temple that was named after him. Let's turn to. Um, I don't know if I gave you this scripture. Acts 13, 22, Paul was talking in the New Testament, and he said after he'd removed Solomon, I mean, after he'd removed Saul, 
King Saul. He raised up unto them David to be their king. And he said, I found David, the son of Jesse, a man of my own heart. He shall fulfill my, my will. And this last line here. And out of this man's seed hath God, according to his promise, raised up unto Israel a Savior named Jesus. The temple that was going to be named after David, the blind man would cry out as he seen Jesus walking. He'd say, Behold the son of David. Over and over the Bible, they call Jesus the son of David. In fact, I want to read this. Let's go to the first book. This kind of shocked me. The first book, the first chapter, the first verse, the first line of the New Testament has David's name in it. The New Covenant. Matthew 1 and 1 says, The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. You see, out of this seed, out of his sperm, out of his offspring, that there was going to be a day that it was going to be the Messiah was going to come and he was going to be a part of the family of David. You mean a man that failed like that? He said, I chose, I remember before, he said, a man after God's heart. David inquired after the Lord. And I said this last week. Do you know that's what he's looking for? He's not looking for a bunch of talented people. He's not looking for a bunch of uh, educated people. Oh, he uses these people. He's, but you know what he's looking for? He's looking for a person who has a heart after him. I don't just want a heart after me. I ain't a heart after the world. What do you want, Lord? And because of him, he took him, and this became the heritage of, of, of David, that he would be called, Jesus Christ would be called the son of David, the son of Abraham. The son of Abraham just simply meant Abraham was what we call the father of faith. And John talked about it Monday night. Really and truly, the only, what you really see about Abraham, what made Abraham so great, was one thing. He believed God. He just believed God. And all the mistakes, he said, I'm just going to count it as righteousness because he believes me. See how important that was? We got our, our priorities messed up. We, we think it's all about what we see on the outside. The reality is he's looking for somebody that believes him and somebody that loves him. It's that simple. You can just take all the other stuff. You got those two, you really got it. So you, you can pat yourself. If you believe him, well, oh, that's easy said and done. People say, I believe in him. It's different to believe him. That's when you can't see what's going on. And you still believe him. That's what Abraham did when the Lord said, you go and go sacrifice your son. He didn't know what was going to happen. But I found the very first place in the Bible that the word worship is was when Abraham went to take his son up, and he said that Abraham went to worship. So this is leading me into something else about David. I want to probably wrap up David today. We know him as the giant killer. We know him as the one that carried home the ark. We know him as a great king. But you know one of the most wonderful things we know about David is he's the one that wrote Psalms. David was a man who could praise and worship like nobody else. Is David known to be a worshiper? He was a worshiper. The Lord brought this back to me. He's famous for writing the Psalms. David had plenty of reasons to give up on his walk with God, but he remained a radical worshiper. <laughs> In fact, when he went to bring the ark home, you remember the picture when he went to both times? The first thing he did was gather up a bunch of singers and musicians. And he said, you're going to go before the ark, and you're going to sing, and you're going to play, and we're going to shout, and we're going to dance as they brought it in. And the first time he had a little bump in the road, and he had to stop and go back, and he had to reconsider and re recalculate, recalculate. <laughs> he had to repent and turn around and find the path to go on. And that time when he came into Jerusalem, he said he danced so mightily. He met, I said what the word it used, um, I had it down here. But anyway, he, he just, he, he, he danced with all, of, of all his might. That's what it says. All his might. You know what might is? It's your ability. You love your Lord, your God, with what? All your heart, your soul, your mind, and your might. That's your physical ability. He danced. He played. David was a skilled musician, too. You know where he learned that? At back on the back side of the back, out there in the wilderness keeping sheep. He learned how to, how, how to worship. He learned how to play. And he had brought the house of God. And David, let me tell you something. David learned, this might be to some of y'all. I, I read David's Psalms. And, you know, they're not just all happy, joyous. 
he complains. <laughs> Sometimes you feel like he's just shaking his fist at God, like, God, where are you? <laughs> oh, he's telling God. He poured out his heart before him, poured out his complaints. You see him, he, he, he talks about his fears. He talks about his weariness. But then at the end of it, every time he come, he pulled himself out by saying, but great is the Lord, his mercy endures forever. He started off just grappling and complaining before he got to the end of that prayer. He'd been praising God and said, I remember when you delivered me, delivered me from the hands of the giant, the Philistines. I remember when you did this. I remember. How many of y'all ever start off prayer talking to God about your problems? And if you're smart, you'll move into worship before you ever get over it. Because that's how you're going to move on. See, David learned that when I put worship out, it'll go before everything else. When I worship, victory is inevitable. When I worship, victory is inevitable. It will happen. You may have to worship a while. You may have to dance a while. You may have to do whatever you do in your might. But after a while, David learned, if I will just continue to worship, because he said, the Lord is my strength. He's my salvation. I wouldn't even be here. I sure wouldn't be king. David didn't even apply for that job. I didn't apply for this job. It's amazing how God will put you places you didn't even mean to go. You didn't know God has got a plan for you so much bigger than you could ever know. Just get to him and you start learning how to worship him through everything going on. You become a worshiper, honey. Victory is ahead. It is a promise. That's why God put it in here. You want to get you down? Get read, Start reading David. I hope David becomes alive to you. And the main thing is about David. I want you to get in the Psalms and you read those Psalms every day. If I'm down anyway, I can just open up the Psalms. And I'm telling you what, you just keep reading. It's so encouraging. David was a role model how to fail and get up and do it right. Remember what I said last week? The difference in a winner and loser is what you do after what you've done. Do you keep on lying about it? Do you just dig your deeper hole? Or do you turn around and say, whoa, right there. I'm going to take the consequences. I'm going to quit lying to get out of trouble. How many young people tried to lie to get out of trouble? And, and that lie, what got you more? You know what? When, when you mess up and you go tell your mom and dad and you say, you know what? I messed up. I'm looking for somebody back there. They was sitting back there with glasses on. Hope you're not laying down. I'm going to come back there and get you. <laughs> if you would go and say, you know what? I did this. And I realize I messed up. You know what? They don't need to discipline you if you've already learned your lesson. You know, mom and daddy are not trying to punish you. They're trying to change you. They're trying to keep you on the right track. God is not trying. Thank you, Melissa said preach it. God is not trying to punish you for sin. Jesus done took the punishment. What he's trying to do is get that junk out of your life so you can get on the right road. Because he's got treasure for you. He's got all your prayers to be answered. But you're asking him and then you head that way. Just keep after him. Be after his heart. Don't stop in the middle of it and give up. John talked about that this morning in prayer. David found that when worship is a response to all circumstances, victory was certain to follow. I believe as, as he was out there on that backside of the wilderness, you know, David didn't apparently did not have a real good relationship with his earthly father. You know, he never calls him son of Jesse. No, Jesus. He, 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 he never was called that. He, you never even hear him talk about Jesse much. His daddy was Jesse. And y'all know the story. When the, when the prophet came to anoint him, his daddy didn't even call him in. He called all of his good-looking sons, brought him in. And, oh, uh, yeah, I have another one, David. How would you feel like that? Do you ever feel like, don't even say it. How many of uh, y'all, you can say, I really kind of felt like that in my house. I might have been the least. Some of y'all know you were the favorites. But you know what? Sometimes we didn't feel real appreciated, loved, and valued in our homes, and sometimes by our own natural fathers. Do you know they put David in a very low job of out there keeping sheep? That was a servant's job. But you know what? He had him, it was dangerous. If it hadn't been dangerous, David wouldn't have been uh, wrestling with a bear and a lion. That was some bad wilderness. Lions and bears and tigers? Uh-huh. Mom, oh, my. Oh, me? Well, David was out there. He was rejected. He was put down. There was, his birth was questionable. There's things in there that show us that there's something going on in David's family that he was rejected. But, you know, I believe it's because of that is what made him great. 
because he didn't have a natural daddy to lean on. He didn't have anybody out there. He didn't send servants out there with him to protect him. David had learned to trust in God through the hard times. Amen. You know that's when you learn to trust him. When you got it together, why would you need to trust him? You trust in you. You trust in your bank account. You trust in your talent. You trust in your mate. You trust in it's just going to be okay. But let me tell you something. Let him walk out the door. Let him get a, a, a cancer diagnosis. Let all of a sudden your child. I'm telling you, when it's on those times that we need him is where we depend on him. Now, we can learn to just depend on him and thank you, Jesus. I done learned my lesson. Don't make me go through that one again, Lord. Don't Job me anymore. Somebody said that, you know, that story of Job. I've been Jobed. You ever feel like you've been Jobed? I don't need to be Job, Lord. But David, during those hard times when he learned to trust God, that's when he learned to play that harp out there by himself. They would bring him to the house of the king. They'd play one day with the king. That's when he wrote those psalms. David was a great writer, too. He was able to write those things, and you read about them in his study. But it was because of that, I think he could be real honest with God. That's why when you read in the psalms, he can gripe and complain, and, and he's just talking like, it, I mean, it's amazing how much trust he has in God. Do you know that's why you act worse at home? It's because then you do in front of people because you trust the people at home. They can't leave you real easy. <laughs> But that's a David. You can see he was at home with God. What David had was like a father-son relationship. I never thought about it. I thought about how he talked to God. He talked to that God like I really, because I had a good daddy. I was blessed to have a good daddy. And I could talk to my daddy like that. We could argue. Oh, we were, I was his firstborn. I was as strong and bullheaded as he was. <clears throat> That's why God gave me this awesome man to keep me under control. The level of humility and honesty that David had in his writings and in those times of need led him to true worship, a place of surrender, a place of trust. God, David's psalms did not just include good things, but he it had his woes, his complaints, his raw emotions. He was not afraid of being bare, to be transparent, honest before his God with his wide range of human emotions. See, when you really know how much God loves you, you can be honest with him. There's people like, I don't want God to know that. <laughs> Think again. <laughs> Think that one through. And I go, oh, yeah, you see me when I'm in the shower. What am I got to hide? He knows everything. That's a bad, that's a bad image. Uh, he knows everything about you and loves you just the same. He knows everything about you and called you just the same. He knows what he's put in you. He knows what he's trying to bring out of you. Don't be discouraged. Don't be discouraged. He did not just seek God's opinions and his approval about things, but he had an intimate, loving, father-son relationship with him above no other. I believe this come out of the fact that David did not have a real good relationship with his father, natural father, one of the reasons. That very source of pain is what would be the catalyst to catapult him into to, to the kingdom was the pain. I've said this to you guys many times that usually many times that your greatest pain becomes your greatest power. Some of the most famous groups, think about AA. AA was out of men that were alcoholics that learned some secrets of really applying God's word to, to, being, to be sober and how to walk through things and find out not, not just not to drink or do drugs, but actually to find out why you do them. And it involves what? It involves some personal looking at yourself real deep. It, 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 it includes some making some amends. Because when you start looking at yourself, the first thing you're going, oh, my Lord. I remember what I did to that person. I know now why my kids might be where they are. Or maybe I'm going through another divorce. David learned the power of worship. And as he come home with the ark that day, he, had, he made a party, man. He said, we're going to have food, we're going to have music, we're going to singing, and we're going to have sacrifice. Sacrifice. Did you know worship involves sacrifice? What is worship? 
Actually, I had, I, run, I had it on my iPad, but I'm just going to, from my mind, I know, I guess it was the beginning of last year, maybe in January. I think it was when the Lord, might have been the year before. Well, years fly by, don't they? But I was sitting over there, and, the, and everything was so awesome, and the, the group sounded like it did this morning. I'm thinking, wow. There's not any pastor in the world be any more proud than what we have going on here. I mean, David's over there beating him drums, and sometimes it's Mark beating us drums. We have all these people that are so talented. And, and they was praising. I was like, wow, this, this worship is so amazing. And the Lord asked me a question. Right there, I heard in my head, he said, is this worship? <laughs> it's the best. Actually, I didn't say that because I know he asked the question. <laughs> There's probably something I need to learn here. He says, is this worship? See, we get to thinking that what we have outward things, we think that's worship. Because singing is part of worship. Clapping hands. I can read you some of the outward worship things. But I, I, I said, okay, I went home and I, I, I looked it up. I said, well, maybe I don't really know what worship is. Well, I realized the word worship itself comes from the word to, to be prostrate, to be flat. It means to bow, to crouch. In homage to royalty. It's that place all of a sudden if you come in, I guarantee even today if you have the role of, 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 of the Queen Elizabeth, is that, no, yeah, yeah, she's still alive, yeah, she's still alive, sorry. Uh, but I mean, you, people bow, don't they? There's something about it. And I, it's funny because the day when we were singing, I just felt myself just bowing before the Lord. It's something that comes on the inside that happens in you on the inside that works its way on the outside. But if it's not coming from the inside, then it's really not worship. Because it's a condition of the heart. Now, back then, it was all about the physical. But it's a condition of the heart. And I'm getting a little ahead of myself here. But uh, when David, when he were to, brought the ark, he would go a few steps and they'd stop and they'd sacrifice. I think they sacrificed seven bullocks and seven rams every so many feet. I mean, that was a bloody road. Every so much long. And they would sacrifice. He understood. And there was a time that, and David, he was going to go make a sacrifice after all those people got killed over his bad choices. Uh, he went to ask because I got to go, I got to go sacrifice. And he went to the threshing floor. He was going to buy this field, this, this threshing floor. He wanted to sacrifice. And, and, the, and the man that owned it says, no, king, you can have it. I'll give it to you. I'll give you the, I'll give you the animals to sacrifice. He said, no, I will not give to the Lord something that, that something does not cost me. If it doesn't cost me anything, it's not sacrifice. Don't be surprised. There's some things in your life that God is asking you to lay on this altar because that's what this is. It's a place of sacrifice. Whatever he brings to your heart, you may be saying you need to sacrifice that. Do you know what the word sacrifice means? Sister Kelly picked this up from me some years back. I ain't got to got it from somebody else. Sacrifice is giving up something you love or want for something you love or want more. Can I say that again? Sacrifice is giving up something you love or want for something you love or want more. Some of you sacrifice sleeping in this morning. You might like do that, but you're like, no, I'm going to get up and I'm going to get those kids. Well, we got school all week. Quit whining about that. You get them up for all kind of crazy stuff. You keep them out way in the night for some band concert. You get them up early in the morning for track and have them out there. But it comes time for Sunday, honey. Well, just let little baby sleep in today. Oh, you might we wishing that you had, while you have a chance, you need to get them to church. Let them sleep in on their time later. How about that? A little extra there. I'll throw that in there. Somebody said they smelt soap in there. I said, I'm going to be doing some cleaning today. Hope they're going to clean, clean that up there a little bit. Sacrifice. Worship is a lifestyle, and sometimes it's a sacrifice. Hebrews 13, 15, it says, By him, therefore, let us offer the sacrifice of praise to the Lord continually. That's the fruit of our lips, giving thanks to his name. It's continually? How am I going to give thanks to him continually? Do you know what my life's like right now? No, he said, here's what he said later on. He said, in everything, give thanks. He didn't say for everything. Some people misquote that. Well, I just thank God for my flat tire today. Well, honey, you're more spiritual than me. I do not thank God for that. But in the middle of that, I can thank God. In the middle of standing on the side of the road, and I can say, Lord, you're going to take care of me, Daddy God. I know what the Word said. You're never going to leave me and forsake me. You're going to bring somebody to my rescue today. I can thank you on the side of the road till it happens. I'm going to praise you till I see the answer on its way. Because worship and praise will precede victory. I can start praising. He said, let every request you have be made known with thanksgiving. 
Lord, I thank And when we do prayer, meet no money nights. I, y'all hear me do this all the time. Lord, I thank you that you've heard our prayer. I thank you, Lord, you're going to heal this person at the right time, the right place. I thank you that we can bring this before you. Thank you, Jesus. You tore the veil in two. And I can come right up into your throne. I don't need no priest to go in for me. I don't need no friend to go in for me. I don't need no preacher to go. I could go myself right straight to the throne of God. Because now I'm in Christ and he's in me. He is the high priest, the Bible says. And he is the one that makes atonement for my sin and my needs. He said, come boldly to the throne of God for the time of, to receive help in the time of need. When you need to help somebody, you can go to him. Isn't that powerful? Continually. Let the sacrifice of praise be to God continually. It's the fruit of your lips. You're giving it to him. That's, that was... Uh, Hebrews 13, 15. 1 Peter 2, 5 says, You also, as lively stones, you're built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices accepted to God by Jesus Christ. Psalms 34 and 1, I'll bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall be continually in my mouth. Psalms 71, 14, my hope will, I will hope, expect, continually, my praise will be before you more and more and more. First Thessalonians, I already quote that, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ concerning you. You want to know the will of God? I'll tell you. Start praising him for what you got right now. Oh, I just see the will of God about, my, about what's going to happen. You know what? That's his will. Start thanking him in advance. Lord, you know what job I need. You know what person I need. You know what my kids need. You know how uh, you're going to bring me a companion. And Lord, I thank you, Lord, that it's not good to be alone. You're going to do that. If I'll trust you and if it's the best thing for me, there ain't nobody going to stop it. And this time it ain't going to be like the last three losers. I got to smile sometimes. Whew, let me tell you something. The enemy wants to stop you from praising. See, praising is when you're telling God how big he is. And you start praising him long enough, before you know it, you're going to enter right into worship. And you ain't going to care what anybody thinks. You're going to be like David. When David got before that ark, when he came in the city, his wife looked down there, uh, uh, Michael, and, and she was so jealous. And she, Oh, I was going to read what she said. It was pathetic. Oh, my, let me just read about that woman. And, uh, honey, you, oh, thank you, Jesus. I can't hear everything Gary's saying over there. Where would I have that at? I thought I had it marked. But she started making fun of him. I'm going to tell y'all. I have it here somewhere. Okay, maybe it's over here. I've gone all over my page. See, God can use people like me too. Well, anyway, I don't have it right here. Oh, it's uh, 6 and 20. 6 and 20. Okay, I have it right here. I had to have it right there. What's wrong with my glasses? David returned to bless the household. And Michael, the daughter of uh, Saul, came out to greet David. And she said, how glorious. Here, a little sarcasm here. A little hostile humor. <laughs> how glorious was the king of Israel today who uncovered himself today in the eyes of all the handmaidens. She's real worried about them women looking at him. And of his servants, as one vain fellow shamelessly uncovered himself. See, the Bible said he danced so hard and so unshamely his cloaks fell off. I don't know if he got... All uncle, but his kingly robes fell off of him and he just looked like a regular old guy out there and she's making fun of me she said you're out there like some vain shameless I think they wrote a song about shameless don't start singing it and David said to Michael this was before the Lord woman I was doing this to the Lord which chose me before your father and before all oh he started talking about the family I don't suggest that one I do not suggest that you start talking about her daddy. I'll tell you. That, mm, mm, yeah. It's no wonder that woman was hacked off. If he goes there. He said, I, 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 the Lord chose me before your daddy did. <laughs> I just saw that. It's so funny. He said, uh, and, and, and to appoint me ruler over the people of Israel. There, therefore, I will play before the Lord. He said, lady, you think this is bad. I'm going to play and you ain't going to worry about it. He said, I will yet more be vile than this. I'm going to be so embarrassing to you, honey. You just want to hang on. You shouldn't have said that because you just agged me on. He said, I'm going to do it harder. I'm going to do it more. I will do more. And he said, I will base my own eyes in my, in my sight. And the, ma and the maidservants which you have spoken of them, I shall be held in honor. 
He said, you might have contempt for me and you may not understand, but the little people down here, the little servants, they're going to know what it's like to praise God. You're sitting up there in your palace, Miss Queen, and here I'm down here. I ain't doing this for you. I was one of the little people. I know what it's like to be on the backside of a, a field with my mom and daddy's left me and I'm having to fight by myself. I had become my own defender. I had to learn how to defend my, myself. I will praise God and you can just keep your mouth shut because the people that matter are going to see it and they are going to know that there's a God in Israel because I am going to lift him up. Let me tell you something. The devil was in all kinds of distractions, sometimes in your own home and sometimes in your own spouses. We can do that. We can discourage one another. Who do you think you are praising God how you talked to me this morning? You better hope he praises God. That's the only thing going to change his heart. I just feel like such a hypocrite. We had a fight. Me and Gary have many. I ain't looking at some of y'all. We have arguments sometimes on the way to church. Now, not as bad as it used to be. Because we had a whole parcel of kids. Our kids and foster kids. And, and we had all reasons to get into it on Sunday mornings. Because he just over there like, oh, you ready to go yet? <laughs> well, I ask you to, to iron Morgan's dress and I ask you to find Joda's shoes and I ask you to get Melissa in here. I ain't gonna say oh Melissa she's here. Oh there's all kind of distractions that can come to help to stop you from praising God. The devil's mouth is a liar and he will try to shame you. We don't praise God because we're perfect. We praise God because he is perfect. He is the perfect one. I lift up holy hands today unashamed, not because I'm righteous, but because I'm covered with the blood of Jesus. And that makes me holy. And I can praise him even when I've acted a little crazy this week. Isn't that awesome? You got permission to do it. Let me tell you what happens when you praise. Number one, it changes me. It changes me. It, 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 I cannot sit here and, and stay stressed out when I start oh, praising him. Uh, worry and worship does not go in the same sentence. When I start worshiping him and I start praising him and I start telling him, the, as David said, oh, magnify the Lord with me. In other words, make him big. He, he, you can't make him any bigger, but you make him bigger in your conversation, in your mind, in your attitude. When you start saying, you are great, you are great to be praised, you are merciful. Thank you, Lord, that you don't give me what I deserve. You start praising him, it changes you. It changes the perspective. Your confidence starts rising when you bring his problems into his presence. Bring your problems into his presence and lay them on the altar and say, you see how weak I am, Lord? This is why I'm here. It's because I need you. When you've got that heart that I need you, that's when the greatness comes. It was Saul that said, I don't really need him. I got it. I don't need to wait on the, the, prop, uh, the priest to sacrifice. I got this. Oh, I know God told me to kill all those people. Nah, I think I want to save the best for sacrifice. See, he thought he knew more than God. He was logic. He followed his own reasoning. That's the devil. Your own reasoning, I'm telling you. You want to talk about the enemy? That's your enemy. Is the, is the logic of your flesh. It says, I don't need to act all that way. I'm not going to jump up down like Sister Pam with her heels. Well, you don't have to. You may not feel what Sister Pam feels either. I'm telling you, I, I'm one of those, I'm kind of, you don't all have to act like me. Please don't act like me, everybody. But the truth is, act like you. Be real about who you are. Get off the shame kick and what people are going to think about me or what I did in my last church. This ain't your last church. It ain't your first church, but hopefully it's going to be your last church. <laughs> there you go. Number two, worship changes the atmosphere. Amen. Oh, yeah, it moves the heart of God. It's not because he's some egotistical God that desires to be praised. Because, but what he is, he's a father that wants you to love him back. I wrote a song on my album. It's called Love Him Back. I just released a video about it because it may not be the best song, but it's my message song. That's why I put the money out there to do a video. Because I want people to know, really, all God wants you to do is love him back. Because in loving him back, you want to worship him. In loving him back, you want to obey him. In loving him back, you want to be a good representative of your daddy God. Loving him back changes everything. It's the good life. It's receiving his love and loving him back. Worship connects us as a family. It, it changes, it charges the atmosphere, and it connects us as a family. When we start praising, singing those same songs up here, y'all know what happens in the house. Boy, it start, the little, the little um, river that comes up, he said, we have out of our body, our mouths, will, out of our bellies will flow what? Rivers of living water? What, uh, streams? Is it streams? Anyway, but what, it's water that comes out. It's the spirit. 
Rivers. And it comes out when you put your stream and your stream and your stream and your stream. All of a sudden, there's a river in the house. See, everybody, your mouth is important. It's very important that you speak up and you speak out and you give him praise. And you give him worship and you tell him how much you love him. You can just learn, you start doing it, uh, uh, just whisper it under your breath. You see, let me tell you something. If you think worship, though, is just because you're singing, because you're clapping your hands, you're mistaken. We can sing songs and we can speak uh, words of praise, and, and we think that really lifts us up. Uh, it helps us. It, it moves the, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, our attention. But the truth is, in Matthew uh, 15, 8 through 10, he said, uh, The people draw nigh to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. You ever sing a song and you're buying groceries somewhere in your head? Thinking about what you're going to do, what you're going to eat? Ministry, what am I, gonna, what am I fixing to do? He said, they're in vain. It's, it's vain worship. And he said, and not only that, but some people think worship is if they do everything right, they're worshiping. He said, in vain they do worship me, teaching for, doctrines, for doctrine the commandments of men. They're telling you all these things that man told you, and that's how you worship. Just do this, do this, do this. And let me tell you something. This is not all about, this is not about what you do. It's about who you are. It's about a condition of your heart. Um, let me, oh, man, I wonder, I'm out of time, but I wonder to really read some of the psalms that David did. And I, I just want you to, in fact, I'm just going to, I'm going to just read over quickly these. And just to encourage you uh, to get out the psalms. And you can open them up anywhere. I just opened up my Bible, and I looked down at some of the things that I had marked. And I, I don't expect them to follow me, but Psalms 95, he says, Oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord and make a joyful noise uh, to the, God, the rock of our salvation. See, they're singing. And then there's a joyful noise. Now, some of y'all think, that's uh, my singing. It's, uh, it's off, but it's a joyful noise. I don't really think that's what he's talking about. But your singing is your singing. God don't care if you're in tune or not. We, John does if you're going to get a mic in your mouth. But um, a joyful noise, yeah, I make them all the time. I don't realize it. Y'all hear me up there? I go, woo! Woo! Yeah! It's a joyful I can't stop it. And you know what happens? It's praise coming out of my belly, and it charges the atmosphere. It starts happening in the room. And we all start doing that. See, people, oh, we got to be all quiet. There's a time to be quiet. There's a time to learn. But let me tell you something. That, this here, he, it's not a, a, worship and praise is not all quiet. Praise it has to be said, or it's not praise. You worship in your heart, but you praise with your mouth. You have to say something. You have to say, oh, I'm praising um, this person, I'm praising this singer, I'm praising this politician. You praise somebody, it means you're talking about goodness. I'm praising my husband. I'm praising my kids. It's something you say. But here he is in Psalms, he said, Sing to the Lord and make a joyful noise. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving. Make a joyful noise, again, unto the Lord with Psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. Uh, five, his, the sea is in his, is his. He made it. His hands form the dry ground. Oh, come, let us worship. Let us bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord. That's verse 6. Bow and kneel are two ways to worship. It's, when you start, it's that thing that starts happening. Bowing and kneeling. He said, let's come before the Lord, our maker. For he's our God. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. Isn't that not beautiful? Ooh, he started by, uh, David, he goes on down in verse uh, 8. Give to the Lord the glory, do his name, and bring an offering when you come into his courts. That's we bring, we bring our tithes and offerings. We bring the first fruits and honoring him to say, Lord, you, I wouldn't even have this $100 if you hadn't gave it to me. Here's the first 10 I give back to you as a seed to say, look here, I have appreciation. It's an offering. It's a sacrifice I give to him. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Fear before him in the earth. Uh, I love it. he talks about the earth. He said, let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let the sea roar in the fullness thereof. Have you ever sat in front of the ocean and heard that roar? It's glorious. It's the ocean, he said, would praise him. He said, let the fields be joyful and all that's within. Let the trees of the wood rejoice. Another place, he said, let the trees clap their hands. You ever heard the wind? It just sounds like they're clapping their hands. Let the trees rejoice. Um, Oh, the heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people will see his glory. 
Psalms 100. Oh, it's one of my favorites. Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise again to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It's he that made us. Not we ourselves. We're his people. We're the sheep of his pasture. Do you see how many times he talks about sheep? Because he was a shepherd. He knows what it's like to care for the sheep. David was, this is David writing some of these things he wrote when he was out there. Things he learned from his personal experience. Do you know your way of praising comes from your personal experience? It comes from what you know God as. It's the like as. He's like a good shepherd. That's where he said, I, he, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He leads me beside still uh, waters. That uh, green pastures, that's David. That's the man who slew the giant. That's the man who slept with Bathsheba. That's the man who danced with his clothes, plumb off, because he loved the Lord. All the facets of David, the good, the bad, and the ugly, this is what come out of him, worship. He learned the power. Know you not that he's the God that made us, not ourselves. We're his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving. That's how you start. And then go a little further into his courts with praise. Be thankful for him and bless his name. Verse 5, for the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures for all generations. Wow. Psalms 103, bless the Lord, O my soul. All that's within me, bless his holy name. Forget, oh, he said, don't forget his benefits. He forgives my iniquities. He heals my diseases. He, oh, it just goes on. Uh, it's, it's, he's not dealt with us after our sins or reward us according to our iniquities. Thank God. We'd all be struck by lightning. For as the heavens is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those that fear him. As far as the east is from the west, he's removed our transgressions from us. David knew what it was like. When he stood there and realized it came to him, he killed one of his best friends in the world. Over a woman. Oh, thank you. See, David was passionate when he wrote these things. It came out of his pain. It came out of his joy. It came out of his life experiences. You have something to give him today. Sing, bow your knees, kneel, give an offering, clap your hands. Oh, he says, uh, clap your hands, all you people, shout unto the Lord with a voice of triumph. Praise him on the instruments. These are all things that David talked about. He said, another place I didn't go to, he said, talk of his wondrous works together. For he listens. What do you talk about when you get on the phone? What do you text about on the phone? Are we praising God with our life and reminding each other how God is great? This is one of my favorite scriptures, Psalms 141, 2. He said, let my prayer be set forth before thee as incense, and the lifting up of my hands be as the evening sacrifice. Back then, they had physical sacrifices. Today, he said, it's as simple as you lifting up your hands as the evening sacrifice. You know what I'm lifting up my hands, what it is? It's me giving me. He, he said he don't now want the sacrifice of goats and bulls. He wants your life to be a living sacrifice. He wanted dead sacrifices. Now, now he wants live ones. We're living sacrifices. He said that, I beseech you, brethren, by the mercy of God, you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable act of worship. That's what he wants from us, to give him me. Because, see, he said it was no longer just going to be a physical act. But in John 4, 23, he said, The hour comes and now is that true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth. The Father seeketh such to worship him. For God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. You know what he's saying right there? This is not about the physical. It's now about the heart. And when you start to worship him in your spirit and you're talking to him, before you know it, you'll be clapping. You'll be lifting up your hands in the sanctuary. I, I, a whole bunch of scriptures said lift your hands, about five of them. Lift your hands in the sanctuary. Lift your hands. I don't know why churches miss that one. It's all through there where he says lift up your hands in the sanctuary. Bless the Lord. Uh, over and over he says. And, and, and here he said he wants you to, he's looking for people that will worship him in, down deep in your spirit. He didn't say he was looking for preachers, singers, workers. He was looking for worshipers. Are you, is that you? Kids, is that you? Are you learning to worship at a young age? To love him back and to use your voice. 
I know when y'all go to camp and y'all go to these concerts, y'all back there screaming and hollering and jumping them down and all that kind of stuff. But you know what? I want to see. I'm not saying we have to get all crazy. But you know what? I don't mind getting as crazy as David if that's what it takes. David was not afraid of looking like a child, looking like a fool. He didn't care what people thought because he loved God. He depended on him. He knew the praise is what's going to happen. Let me wrap the three things I've got out of this. That praise is not just what you, praise is what you say and worship is what you do. So keep praising and worshiping God even when you fail. Remember, it matters what you do after what you've done. Trust his mercy and love. Trusting is how you get through things. Humble yourself and worship your way through. When you have messed up or you're having a bad day, humble yourself and worship your way through that day. Just put on the, force yourself, put on the music, put it on your iPad, put it whatever you got to do, put it on and start worshiping your way through that problem. Talking to God and magnifying him and let's see what happens to your day. Number ten, two, give thanks in all things. He's working things for our good. And when you start giving him thanks and giving him praise, it helps you keep the faith when you remember what he's done. And when you start verbalizing his word, it helps you to remember that God, what he did once, he'll do it again. It raises you up. And when your faith rises, then there's nothing impossible with praise. Number three, it's an attitude of the heart. And this attitude on the inside will radiate out into the physical. Worship will become a lifestyle. And people around us will see there's a God. And they will see because you love him and you praise him, there's nothing any more attractive. People have been so sick of religion that it was a bunch of do's and don'ts and I'm condemned and they're a bunch of hypocrites. Well, you know what? What they were saying is people were fallible. And back in the day, we had to go to church and put a church face on. You know, I don't put people down like, oh, they're a hypocrite. At least they're coming. What are you doing? Sitting back and grappling? You know what? They're coming. You know what? If you're in the presence long enough, that's where the changes happen. So you're feeling like a hypocrite. Well, I can't go because I... Forget all that's a lying devil. Quit the lie, the, quit receiving the lies. This is how you're going to get to where you're going to go. You're going to worship your way through it. Remember who you are and whose you are.